wonder Consider all the worlds thy hands have made I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder Thy power throughout the universe displayed Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee How great thou art, how great thou art Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee How great thou art, how great thou art On August 28th 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. gave his historic speech, I Have a Dream, from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., to a crowd of more than 250,000 people. As he rallied all Americans, all North Americans, indeed all people everywhere, to justice and equality, to fairness and dignity for all, Dr. King warned his own people. In this prophetic call for freedom, Dr. King warned African Americans who were pursuing their civil rights with the following words delivered early in his speech. But there is something, and I'm quoting Dr. King now, but there is something I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. But today, as much as ever before, and in some ways more, then in many other times in history, bitterness and hatred is an accurate definition of the mood in many countries and nations around this world, including our own United States. Political leaders of all sizes, shapes, forms, and ideologies are willfully and deliberately inciting bitterness and hatred so that we are now, again, particularly in these United States, incredibly divided and alienated. Political leaders are trying to satisfy their own lust for power by pandering to the base instincts of voters, urging their followers to drink deeply from the cup of bitterness and hatred. Listen to what's called talk radio sometime. Talk radio hosts stir the pot of animosity and racism all the time. It's good for ratings. It's good for advertisers. But it's a raging evil that spreads like a wildfire. Radio talk show hosts are satisfying the thirst for freedom of their listeners by urging them to drink from the cup of bitterness and hatred. Even worse, in some places, in buildings, many assume to be a Christian church, because, of course, the sign outside says so. Demagoguery, bitterness, bigotry spews and erupts from pulpits like so much raw sewage from a ruptured sewer. And this raw sewage is being spread of all things in the name of Jesus Christ. You know, the Jesus who said, pray for your enemies, turn the other cheek and love your neighbor. It's sad, but true. But this is an insidious evil, this cup of bitterness and hatred that people are drinking deeply from today. Some even who call themselves ministers of Jesus Christ, they're not offering communion with Christ. They're offering those who listen to them and those who follow their teachings and their ministry a deal with the devil. They're offering their followers to drink from the cup of bitterness and hatred. And again, in buildings that take the liberty of calling themselves a church, religious leaders are pouring gasoline on the flames of malice and enmity. 
Christless religious leaders are openly and overtly hostile to those who have some other view. And they justify their hateful rhetoric, saying they're doing God a service. They preach racial hatred rather than the grace and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The doors of many buildings that have the unmitigated gall to call themselves churches of Jesus Christ are really not open to those of other races. They're not open to aliens, to immigrants, to homeless, to crippled, to the poor. Their refusal to welcome those who are physically and spiritually disenfranchised, unwanted, who are poor, crippled, lame, and blind is an absolute clear proof that it's Christless religion that's contained and maintained and proclaimed in such places. Christless religion is heavy on rules, sanctimonious and pious-sounding rules designed to keep the undesirables out and to inject the insiders with feel-good spiritual medicine that keeps them living in a fantasy la-la land where they believe that they and they alone are loved by God. Hi, I'm Greg Albrecht. Welcome to CWR. This is CWR Audio Teaching Ministry, Christianity Without the Religion. Today, our message, as we commemorate, remember, Martin Luther King Jr. during this week in January. Our message is titled, My House Will Be Full, and we'll be reading from Luke chapter 14. Before we do so, let's pray. Dear God in heaven, our prayer today is for peace rather than hatred and animosity, for reconciliation rather than retribution, for turning the other cheek rather than revenge and retaliation. May we rest in Christ rather than actively working for vindication and payback. In the words of that powerful hymn, we pray that you would make us instruments of your peace. May your love increase, and may walls of pride and prejudice cease. We join with Old Testament prophets Isaiah and Micah yearning for swords to become plows and spears to be transformed into pruning hooks. This we pray in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Before we discuss our keynote passage, which is actually Luke chapter 14, verses 15 through 24, and if you have a Bible handy and you're in a place, you're not driving in your car, you're not working out at the gym, or wherever you may be on an airplane listening to us, on an airplane you can pull out your Bible if you have one in your carry-on baggage, but or your iPad, you could uh, flip to that and come to an electronic digital version of the Bible in Luke chapter 14. But if you're not in such a place, we'll be looking at Luke chapter 14, and we'll be paraphrasing this passage, but first of all, discussing a little background about chapter 14, verses 15 through 24, which is our keynote passage today. In the first 14 verses, which will not be specifically looking at, but it provides a prelude, a prologue, and context for our passage. We see that Jesus had been invited to dinner at the house of a prominent Pharisee, and Luke tells us that, quote, he, that is Jesus, was being carefully watched, end quote. The dinner was held on the Sabbath, and there were religious authorities there hoping that they could trip him up in some way so they could find him guilty of breaking the Sabbath. Sharing the meal, of course, was just a pretext. It was a sham. And, of course, Jesus, as God in the flesh, was fully aware of their silly little games, wasn't he? As he is aware of any silly little game that you and I have ever played, he's aware of all of humanity's silly little games. But the first thing that Luke tells us that happened at the Sabbath meal was the presence of a man whose body was abnormally swollen. This you'll find in the first 14 verses of Luke chapter 14. Given the context of the acrimony and condemnation present at this dinner, at this gathering 
as the first verse tells us in Luke chapter 14 and, and verse 1 tells us that many present were carefully watching Jesus, it might have been that some of the religious leaders had arranged to have someone who was miserably sick and afflicted right there in front of Jesus. Such was their religious duplicity that they may have wanted to see if they could entice Jesus into being compassionate for him and healing him and then breaking their Sabbath, and then they could get him. So Jesus asked these uptight religious leaders if it was lawful to heal on the Sabbath day. They were smart enough not to answer that question, for either answer they could have given would have called their own religion into question. So Jesus then, having not received an answer, healed the man. He then explained to all those watching that if a child or an animal fell into a well on the Sabbath day, that even they, for all of their religious paralysis and rules and regulations, would pull the child out and save the child or the animal. Again, Jesus was greeted only with silence. But Jesus was just warming up. Then he looked around the table and he observed how the places of honor at the banquet were occupied. So Jesus gave all the guests at the banquet a parable explaining that when you invite someone to a banquet, it's really more appropriate to voluntarily take the lowest place, not a place of honor, but one furthest away from the guest of honor and from the host, and take that place rather than the best, rather than fighting for the chief seat. Following that parable, he looked at the host of the banquet, and he told him that the next time that he had a banquet, that is the host, he should forget about asking his neighbors, friends, and so-called important people, but instead this well-to-do Pharisee should invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. And in doing so, the host would be blessed and repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Remember this instruction that Jesus gave to the host at the banquet about inviting the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. He's going to repeat that instruction again as we continue in Luke chapter 14. Following Jesus' mention of the resurrection, the prominent Pharisee, the big wheel who was the host of the dinner, thought he should at least try to say something that sounded holy and religious. So he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast and the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, Well, you mentioned the kingdom of God. Let's talk about that. So then he gave the parable of the great banquet, which is our keynote passage today in Luke chapter 14, verses 15 through 24. But for lack of time, instead of reading it, I'm going to paraphrase it. In the parable of the great banquet, a person Jesus calls a certain man, quote-unquote, was preparing a great banquet. This, quote, certain man, end quote, is called, in the parable of the great banquet, the owner of a, a house, a big house. So when the, quote, certain man, end quote, who owns this big house gives directions to his servant, the servant calls him the master. So this certain man is also called the master. And the certain man is preparing in this parable a huge feast, and he invited many guests. Now, the parable doesn't specifically say so, but let's think of those people as those who were invited as people with whom the certain man, quote-unquote, went to church. These people would have considered themselves to be okay with God. They would have been, uh, you know, among the religious elite. They might have been spiritual legends in their own minds, as we often speak of people who seem to be religiously proud and haughty. But for some reason, those people who seem to be religiously okay, in their own eyes at least, who received the first and most prestigious invitation to come to this great banquet, turned down this, quote, certain man, end quote. They made transparently weak and trivial excuses. The bottom line, though, was that they didn't want to come to the great banquet. They turned him down flat. So this certain man, the owner of the house, the master, instructs his servants to give a second invitation, and then he instructs his servants to go to the poor side of town. And the idea here is not just 
physical poverty, but spiritual poverty. And they're told to go into what amounts to, at that time, the ghettos and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. So Jesus uses that phrase another time in this parable of the great banquet that he gives to this entire gathering who were gathered. They're all worried and hoping that they would, not worried, but hoping that he would break the Sabbath by healing this man who was sick. And Jesus had told the host of the banquet the next time he gave a banquet to invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. And now he inserts that into the parable he gives them. The servant in the parable gave the invitation. The response was amazing. Almost everybody came, but when all, or virtually all, the poor, crippled, blind, and lame were seated in the banquet, or at the banquet, in the banquet room, at this table, there was still room. So the master then tells the servant to leave the town, to go out into the roads and the country lanes and You may remember the phrase used in the authorized King James Version, the highways and the hedges. This third invitation was given to the servant to deliver to people who were living out in the country, away from an organized town. Maybe they were living rough. Maybe they were homeless. Maybe they were were people who lived under bridges because they had no money, uh, out in the forest in little encampments. I don't know, but I don't think it's a stretch to assume that these people were also living outside of the reach of the organized religion that the Pharisee and all of his guests at the banquet represented and to which they paid their dues religiously, if you like. This time, the servant was told to compel these people to come to the banquet. Compel! That word in the context doesn't mean force, but it's a strong word because, of course, God doesn't force human beings to do anything. But the compel has more the meaning of The servant was going to make them an attractive offer, convincing them, telling them that, you know, this is really a good thing. You really need to come. Now, these people receiving the third invitation may well have felt that they were unworthy of going to the great banquet. Maybe they felt they didn't have anything to wear, which would be appropriate at the great banquet. Maybe they were painfully aware of their own spiritual nakedness and maybe even their own physical nakedness and felt unfit to sit at the master's table. Perhaps these people who received the third invitation felt, oh my goodness, invited to this wonderful banquet in this huge house, and but we don't even know which utensil to use, and there'll probably be all kinds of courses of food, and we'll be laughed at and made fun at because we just don't know how to behave. We don't have manners. We haven't been taught proper decorum. But again, the master charged the servant to compel them to make the offer incredibly attractive. And then we read in verse 23 of Luke chapter 14, and I will read this particular verse, why the master was telling his servant to go out to the roads, the country lades, to the highways and hedges, as the authorized King James Version says, Luke chapter 14, verse 23. Then the master told his servant, Go out to the roads and country lades and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. So that my house will be full. The title of our message today, My House Will Be Full, says the Master. The goal of the kingdom of God is not to keep it so narrow, so lean, so trim, that only the people in a certain denomination who do or do not a certain kind of code of conduct during their entire lives are the only ones there in the kingdom of heaven. The goal of the kingdom of God is to fill every seat at the massive table, at the great banquet, so that the master says, my house will be full. The invitation of God to the great banquet is not an offer for the tried and true, best, spiritually perfect, spiritually pedigreed, commandment-keeping, obedient to all the laws, hardest-working people who have a perfect attendance record, who have memorized more biblical passages than anybody else. No. 
It's for the spiritually poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Now, of course, Christless religion attacks God's grace. And they don't want the spiritually poor, crippled, lame, and blind at the great banquet of the kingdom of God. And what a travesty that much of Christendom has made of the great banquet in explaining what the great banquet is and will be. Because Christless religious professionals really don't want flawed people. Now, of course, they may invite the physically crippled, the lame and blind, if they have what's called a healing crusade, but why? To heal them? No, to give glory to the ministry or the church that's sponsoring the healing crusade. But really, inside the perfect little holy huddles, they're not about the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. In fact, it's more evil and bigotry that is unleashed on the unsuspecting, on the alienated, and the impoverished. In the eighth chapter of the book of Revelation, we won't turn there, but you can read an apocalyptic description of a star named Wormwood that falls from the sky into rivers and springs of water, turning the water bitter. What more apt description of the perverse spiritual source that inspires Christless religious leaders as they urge and encourage their followers to drink deeply from the cup of bitterness and hatred. Wormwood is not served at the great banquet. Living water, the true bread of life, is served at the great banquet. There is no cup of bitterness and hatred. We are served at the great banquet by Jesus, the great I Am, who came not to be served, but to serve. And he serves us with his grace and truth. The house of the Lord will be filled at the great banquet. My house, God says, will be full. And it will be filled with people who are sitting in places because they know their need, because they know, apart from God's grace, they really don't deserve a place at this table. And God will ensure that there are plenty of people who are in that condition, who by his grace he brings to himself in such a way that they will respond positively to be seated at that table at his great banquet. So as we remember during this week, Martin Luther King Jr., remember that part in his speech, I have a dream where he spoke of not satisfying our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. In the name of the Lamb of God, the Prince of Peace, the Good Shepherd, may we, number one, be reminded of the great banquet of the kingdom of God, a place where the Lord's house is filled to capacity, and that many present are poor, crippled, blind, and lame. And secondarily, may the true and living waters of Jesus pour over all of us so that we may reject the all-too-human temptation to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for the waters, the living waters, the bread of life from heaven who came down from heaven, who satisfies us spiritually and gives us new life, life forevermore. Keep us safe from the cup of bitterness and hatred and heal that in your own way around this world as you dispense and give your grace we pray this, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Next week, we're going to be talking about prayer, and we'll be basing our message on Philippians 1, verses 9 through 11. Our message will be titled, Transforming Prayer. And in that light, we want you to know how much we appreciate your prayer, your support for this ministry, and we want you to know of our prayers. And we pray that the Lord will bless and keep you. He'll make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you, turning his face towards you and giving you peace.
please join us on our website, www.ptm.org, for more spiritual nourishment that we provide through the many ministries and resources here at Plain Truth Ministries. My Savior, God, to the end.